Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me again for another Throwback Attack podcast. My name's Jack and over the next hour we've got some great memories of weekend mornings on ITV for you. Enjoy. So next up I'm pleased to have with me Jamie Rickers. Hello. Hi Jack, how are you mate? Not too bad, thank you. Yourself? Not too bad at all. I think um, grinning um, grinning and bearing up, shall we say, uh, under all the... uh the lockdown conditions while the COVID-19 tweets the globe. <laughs> so, pretty bored, to tell the truth. <laughs> I know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who uh, totally sympathise with you on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's tough for everybody, so uh, as long as everyone's safe and well, chin up, you know, we will get through it. Definitely, definitely. So, thank you for taking part today, and of course, we're going to uh, discuss children's TV. Uh, you know, back in the day, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is: is um, what was your path to becoming a TV presenter prior to your kids' TV work? Um, I did a music degree, so uh, I was at Colchester. There's, there's kind of three when I was there, three establishments. You had Colchester University, you had the Sixth Form College, and you had Colchester Institute. Um, I've been back there since. It's very, very different now. But when I when I was there, uh, I did. I left school at sixteen and did my A levels at Colchester Institute. Did my A level music there. You know, I did a foundation course uh, or, or a, a performance course for a year, and then I did a three year degree. So I was there six years, and then I came out of that, did a few bits and pieces, and then um, and then found myself in telly. And what was the uh, the first job that you did in television? Oh, well, because I've done a few bits and pieces, um, um, you know, for independent companies and yeah. trying to do bits and pieces. But the actual first job in proper television was in 1997. It was a show called The Weekend Show, and mm-hmm. it was with um, Andy Peters. He was the exec producer on it. Uh, he was also presented it with Emma Forbes, and um, I was the runner on that for eight weeks. And uh, when you were doing that, did you think to yourself, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do do some kids' TV oh, I, presenting? I, I, I thought of that when I was five. So I, I remember watching um, Chris Tarrant doing Tiz Was mm. when I was a kid and going and thinking to myself, you know, that's, that's the job I want. I, I want to be a TV presenter. I want to work in that building. I want to be in front of a live studio audience. Um, I want multi-camera and I want talk back, <laughs> you know, with a, with a chat in your ear. So I, I wanted that since I was five. So, um, yeah, I did everything I could to uh, con my way in and out of buildings before I actually managed to convince Andy to give me work experience. So, uh, yeah, I, I knew what I wanted from a very early age. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. And uh, one of the earlier shows you did um, was Up on the Roof, which went out as part of GMTV's Kids Slot and Weekend Mornings. Um, for those who may not remember or have fuzzy memories of it, um, yeah. tell us a bit about that that particular show. Um, yeah, that, well, that was the first first show I actually uh, produced, directed and, and presented. Mm. So GMTV was a network, so a bit of a strange one this. So you've got ITV, yeah, which is you know, channel, the old Channel 3, yeah? Yeah. Um, but GMTV owned the airspace from 6 until 9.25 so GMTV was the broadcaster, we owned it. So really, ITV had 9.25 in, in the morning until Six o'clock the following day, so it wasn't wasn't um, a twenty four hour network because we own that kind of three and a bit hours, as it were. Yeah. So eventually, what happened is because we were we were shareholders with, with Disney, and ITV bought the remaining twenty five percent of Disney, which effectively bought GMTV, so, i.e., it bought the airspace. So then ITV became that um, twenty four hour network, as it was. That's the kind of simplistic way of looking at it. So whilst I was working on GMTV, I wrote. We we had we had um, Pokemon. So what would happen is you come off the back of a, like a news hour or some some political show, I think it was, and then all of a sudden you'd get this kind of adult graphic. Pokemon would be on, and then it'd go again. And then after that, I think it was Dig It, which then became called Digging It, which was made by Disney. And I came in. I was there to, originally. I was asked to cut the um, the promos for Pokemon, and I said to my boss, "Why haven't we got a presenter? Why can't we do this? Why haven't we done that?" 
And to cut a very long story short, he just said, red tape, politics, blah, 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 just, just knock out the promos. And I had, I had a job with him for, um, for a month just to produce this stuff over Easter. Anyway, as it came to the end of the month, uh, he had a two-week holiday. And I said, look, whilst you're away, I need the work. Let me stay on for two months just to oversee what's going on in the department. Um, and I'll, I'll write you an idea for a show. And if you like it, we can talk about it. And if you don't, well, you know, GMTV can afford me for two weeks. I'm not very expensive. Or wasn't at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went off. And while he was gone, and I got hold of the Pokemon. And I cut uh, one minute out of the show. I'd look, look at bits of it. And I'd chop bits out so I could make up a minute. And then what I did is I made um, a 30-second link either side. Because we were on tape. So I had to fill that, that minute. Otherwise, we'd have a big black hole. Yeah. So then what I did was I got the graphics department to make it like a, a kiddie style friendly graphic as opposed to this kind of newsy one. Put it all together and put it on air. So what would happen is it comes the end of the news hour or whatever it was. It'd be this kind of really kiddie friendly graphic and then me going, all right, welcome to Up on the Roof. And it was called Up on the Roof because I filmed it on the roof on a fire escape. <laughs> which we, weren't, we weren't supposed to be out there, but no one, no one questioned it. And I just thought I'd try it until I get stopped. So that was why it was called Up on the Roof. So um, I said, hi, you know, welcome to Up on the Roof. We've got Pokemon on and coming up today at so-and-so and happy birthday to whoever it was. And I was making it up. They were, you know, we had, no one knew who we were. So I was just making up birthdays and getting mates to say, look, tell us your birthday and I'll, I'll do a shout out for you. Then we go into the into Pokemon. And off the back of that, we had 30 seconds left. And I go, brilliant. More Pokemon, same time next week or tomorrow, whatever it was. Don't forget, send us your email to this, that, and the other. And I set up an email address um, for anybody writing to. See you later on. Bye. And all of a sudden, after about three weeks, our flatline, i.e. zero ratings, because no one was really watching or knew we were there, suddenly started to go up, i.e. we had an audience. And we could start charging more money. When you start charging more money, you've got more license fee. We can then negotiate more airspace. And they eventually put um, a commercial break in between the, the start of, uh, or in the middle of Pokemon, which means I went from half an hour to about 30, 34 minutes, I think it was now, Two links to four links, because obviously we had a top and tail both sides. <clears throat> and that grew. And then we got another cartoon and another cartoon. So we went from Pokemon being half an hour to three cartoons with three breaks and 12 links in about a year. Um, and that's how it started. And up on the roof, just suddenly gained momentum and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Ran to, and that ran to, so that's how it started. Fantastic. I literally took a chance and went, look, we've got nothing to lose. No one's watching it anyway. No one knows we're here. Let me let me make people aware of that they were here, and they said, "Go on then, on your head be it." And luckily for me, it worked. <laughs> it did, and it ran for uh, quite a number of years, and was very five, popular. Five years. Five years, yeah. And um, I, I was watching a few clips of it last night, um, uh, you know, researching for this. And um, I have to say, how on earth anybody, at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning can be that hyperactive and jolly? Um, it takes a certain skill because that's something that I couldn't do. But uh, you look like you're having a lot of fun anyway. Well, it wasn't. We didn't shoot it. It wasn't live. It oh, it wasn't happened. live. Oh, I no, didn't know that. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't live. I mean, I would, I would be in the studio by about half six, seven. I said the studio. It was an office that we painted. Mm. Half six, seven o'clock, kind of tweaking scripts and getting things ready, sorting out cameras and blah, 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 blah. Um, but we did shoot it at uh, eight o'clock in the morning. It was shot probably from 10 o'clock onwards. Um, and then I'd t- take that to the edit suite, do a paper edit, cut it all together, stick it on tape, and it would go out, you know, eight days later, whatever it was. Oh, okay, fair enough on that one. Um, so that explains it then. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I was always so wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I noticed as well that, like in between the cartoons, there'd be lots of like little humorous sketches, but done on like a budget, which kind of made it funnier. I, I thought that was quite good. And you like you're on, a on up on the roof. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I saw. I was um, looking at some stuff the other day actually, and we did things with. Um, we just kind of like experimented stuff. I think we had a lolly. I've got one of those big. Big, big circular, you know, lollipop things, which we, we made into a character, and I'd voice the characters. And, or in between that, we'd have we, we tried to highlight what, whichever cartoon was coming up. So I would, you know, make a joke or do something related to the cartoon, and then we just, you know, the whole thing had to be humorous. It's, it's a tricky one because you had to make it fun, but not too, not too silly. Because you, because we were on for quite a while, especially as it got longer, you suddenly pick up an older audience as you go through. And you also had to make sure that it was a safe destination. So when parents turned the TV on, I saw their kids watching, and they you know, what is this? 
oh, that looks okay. I don't mind the cartoons. The presenter looks all right. It's not too rude or whatever it happened to be. We don't mind the kids watching that. So you have, you've got kind of three different levels of, of age groups of kids coming in. Plus, you've got to entertain the parents or make sure the parents feel safe to, to watch you. Um, so, you, have, you, you know, it's not quite just a question of writing a script and making it funny. You, you've got to incorporate those different parameters and obviously make the script slightly older as, as you're creeping mm. on through the morning. Yeah. Quite, it was difficult at times. Certainly. I mean, what was the one I saw last night, the sketch? It was uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Myrtle. I think it was. It was you as a, a schoolgirl that becomes a superhero that's a bit like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I thought that was a... That rings a bell. Like, we did so many. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if you're on every weekend for five years and you've got 12 links, you tell me you can do the math, 24 links times 100, 104, it's, it's a lot of links. Oh, yes. You know, and different cartoons. We had different cartoons coming. It's, it's um, you know, we were forever kicking out ideas. <laughs> Some work well, some didn't. And, um, I mean, in all that time that you did up on the roof, are there any particular highlights or funny moments that really stick in your memory that make you think, that you know, that was great? Well, we're going back 20 years. Um, <laughs> we got to a point where, um, because the show was doing well and we'd got uh, a bigger budget, I said, um, there was a meeting room and we'd, we'd, we'd gone in and painted it the GMTV colours and got my dad, who's a sign writer and artist, to make some funky signs, and we'd hung those up. <clears throat> but we often used, and there was a kitchen right next to it, and the kitchen was horrible. But I wanted to use, I wanted to start using the kitchen um, and other areas of the of, of the office. We were in a big warehouse on the top floor of our warehouse. It's, it's a lot of space, but where we filmed wasn't that big. So I wanted to make more use of, of the office so we had we, we could do more things. So I ended up getting um, a mezzanine level, putting it over the top of the kitchen, with a glass floor in it, so you could so we could shoot up through the floor and shoot down through the floor. I redid the kitchen, so we got new dishwashers, new um, sinks, new new everything in there. And I would I would do some silly comedy cooking stuff in it, things like that. And then when we were doing, it was the turtles. As you came into the to our, our floor, it was kind of underneath the the, the eaves of, of the, as the roof came down. And I had a design company come in and they built this. Um, inside the interior wall so it looked like the inside of a cave and we used to get um trays of water and we had broken mirrors in it and we'd, we'd shine a light into them um onto the mirror because as the water swished backwards and forwards it made the light bounce i would then put on some silly dripping effects in, in the edit so when we were shooting into it it sounded and looked like we were you know in the middle of this cave and it was all dark and damp and dreary and it wasn't it was you know, right next to the coffee machine. <laughs> so we had we had lots of fun, and it was it was kind of a sense of achievement that we'd gone from me standing on a roof, making up emails and, and birthdays, to actually spending thirty grand on a on a floor and a set that linked into the cartoon. That that was probably one of the one of the defining moments. Fantastic! Uh, from humble beginnings to something that you know became really huge. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I don't know, really, really huge, but it, it, it almost had a kind of mini cult following. You, mm. you know, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of people will come up and say, oh, I remember the apple on the roof, and they'll start quoting things at me, which I'd forgotten about. But, you know, it was, it was 20, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago now, so it was, um, it was a while back. Certainly. And, um, I mean, there was a few other shows around the same time that you were presenting, and I want to kind of touch upon a few of them. Um, th there's one that I remember because it was, it was repeated loads and loads, and it was on CBBC, and it was a game show called All or Nothing. That's right. Was, was that good fun to do? Yeah, that was, that was brilliant. That was the... Uh, that was, you, you know, you have, you have a dream or a goal that's something you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> And that, that was what mine was. I wanted to be a CBBC presenter because mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what I grew up with. BBC was, uh, you know, Philip Stroke with Andy Peters, all those kind of guys. Um, and that was my very first studio show where I had, I think it was about like seven cameras. It was multi, multi cameras. I had a live studio audience um, and I had an, an open talkback. So I, I was suddenly, not only was I just doing it, but it was for the BBC. Um, and I was in that studio. We filmed it in uh, Nottingham, and that was that was that was hard work. I mean, that was really hard, um, but great fun. It, it, it's such a technical process, and, and the the practice of the games and, and and how we rehearsed it months before we got into studio uh, was was exhausting, but worth it. 
Yeah, I guess it must be the crowning moment of glory for any kids' TV presenter to get your own game show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'd rather than just do the link uh, in between the shows, which is one of the things, you know, always a great fun as well, but to have your own series. I mean, we did two series of that, so I had about 26 shows go out. Uh, and, we, and we shot them all, you know, in three weeks. But, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a sense of achievement, and I felt very proud about doing that. And the team I had around me were brilliant. You know, and we were all, all together up in Nottingham in a in a in a hotel for three weeks, and there was a, a lot going on. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was really good fun. And then obviously when that finished, we then had to go and do about a week's worth of voiceover. That yeah, was probably harder than presenting the show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I had to look at it last night. I remember watching it. Um, it, it, it was a good show. Um, I, it, what was it now? It was, um, was was it four teams of kids, two to each, and that. And I always remember that thing where to choose the teams, they'd be like a, a like a plinko machine. They put coloured balls which would kind of fall down and That's it would right. pick the team. Yeah, I remember four, that. Four teams of two, and they grab these balls and, and drop them in the top, and then they kind of bounced away all the way down and then whichever one had the, had the most balls in was, was the team to start I think and that's how we started it yeah and that's to play all uh, like physical games and then yeah uh, there are loads of games climbing walls and um, uh, like bowling tricks and jumping through hoops and target practice and I can't remember so many yeah it was um, yeah, and a lot, a lot of that was um, we, we practiced a lot of those in, um, in the studios back at the BBC because um, a lot of it was, was done with electronics hmm and we had guys operating it from behind the scenes to make sure it all worked properly. So the technical side on that was was immense. The guy, you know, those guys did a, and girls did a really good job. Yeah, they did. They did, and it was a great show. And uh, I, I remember it quite well, actually. I, it, it, like you say, it only had two series, but they they repeated it for years after. Oh well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I remember that it was it was. Um, I used to get into the studio about half six, seven o'clock again, and I'd re- I'd practice. Um, I had three different marks on the floor, depending on which which sequence or how they were going to open. We were going to open the show. They'd say, "Right, we're going to do do it this way," or you know, version A, B, or C. <clears throat> but I used to I used to come on from stage left. So as you're looking at the TV on the right, and Tara, my co-presenter, would come on the other side, and I'd practice for about an hour, every, literally every morning. I'd, I'd go in and I'd get a broom. I'd, I'd help the guys sweep up first. They were like, "This is weird. The presenter's doing that," but you know. I'd, I wasn't interested in just being the presenter. I wanted to be in TV. And we were a team, so I'd sweep everything up so it wasn't flippy. Then I'd stand behind uh, the set where, I, where I'd come in, and I'd practice running out on either my left leg or my right leg <clears throat> and counting the steps and not looking at the floor. So I knew that when I ran out and was waving at the crowd and the cameras are going, I'd get the cue in my earpiece. I would stop exactly on mark A, B, or C without having to look, and I knew exactly where it was. But I'd practice that every morning for an hour before we, we went to air, as it were. Wow, that's dedication. That is dedication. Oh, fear. <laughs> fear as well. Yes, yes. I'm sure uh, you know presenting a, a game show with with a group of screaming kids. I'm sure. I'm sure the fear does rack up a bit there. Yeah, it's not so much the order. It's the it's the technicality behind yeah. it. Remembering the links. What do you got to do? What you got to say? Um, if you know the auto cue could go down, you want to carry it on. Which camera are you looking at? Sometimes I'll swap or you'll get an instruction in your ear telling you to do something or move somewhere. And all, while all that's going on, you've still got to be in command. You're, you're, you're the guy or the girl that is in control of that show. Which is when, you know, you watch someone like um, uh, Dermot O'Leary when he, when, he's, when he was presenting uh, The X Factor and things like that. And they come on that and that's when, when, when they're in full swing and they're interviewing people. You can tell, well, I can tell, not most of the time, where if you look, sometimes they'll talk to people on, on camera for 30 seconds, other times it might be 10, and you know they've got to fill time or hold back time. And, and to do it that well, that slick, especially on a show like The X Factor, I mean, those guys are good. You know, it, it takes, a, it takes a, a skill to be able to fill two time and not be rude and cut somebody off when you're being shouted at in the ear by the producer because you've got to make time. Um, and that, that's what people don't realise. So when you see all these reality TV stars getting their own show, you just think, God, if that went down, they wouldn't have a clue. But if you, were, if you can present properly, you can hold that show on your own. And that, that's the skill. That's what they're paid for. Well, that's what we were paying for. Certainly. And that's the one thing you don't realise as a viewer, just the, 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 the sheer skill. You know, people just think, oh, just stand in front of a camera and, and talk. You don't yeah, realise yeah, the sheer it's, it's, skill. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more 
a lot more than standing in front of a camera and, and talking. Anybody can stand in front of a camera and talk, but you've got to have... If, if, you, and, if you and I were having a conversation face-to-face or you're talking to people, people are emotive, so people react. It's body language, they'll nod or they'll shake their head. It's an agreement. The camera can't do that. You talk to a camera and it keeps still. If it moves, then the audience at home start to get seasick, all right? So there's no one responding to what you're saying, whether you say a joke or whether you're telling a story. There is no interaction with anybody behind that lens. So you've got to pretend that's happening. You've got to make yourself be wanted to be watched by those people um, in order to come back time after time. And that's where the skill lies, being able to connect with whatever that demographic or that audience is. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And um, a couple of other shows that you presented that I, I want to mention. I mean, there was a few on CITV. Um, one in particular that sticks in my memory um, was a show called The Yuck Show, which was yeah. uh, about disgusting facts. I mean, that must have been a good laugh to do. Did that in Wales. That was a bit like an early horrible history. Kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I presented that with a girl called Naomi. She was stuff on the BBC. She's lovely. Uh, yeah, we had great fun doing that, and we got very, very messy. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the most, the one sketch I, re- I remember more than anything. It was about Henry VIII. I can't remember exactly what the sketch was, but I was dressed up as Henry VIII, and we had this big table full of food, and it was Naomi's link, so she was the one kind of running that item, as it were. And I was just told just to be obnoxious and loud and eat. Of course, I just tucked into this food like a pig eating my hands. And we had to do the take twice because you couldn't start laughing. And if you ever see that shot again, you'll see her eyes are glazed where she's trying, trying to hold back the tears and not, not do a third take because I kept <laughs> mucking about. Um, and, she, and she did it brilliantly. So, I mean, it was, it was me mucking about being a real swine, but she, she was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was a great show. Um, I was trying to remember myself because, unfortunately, there seemed to be absolutely none of it on online for me to look at. But the um, the, the one I remember sketch was I think there was one about gladiator sweat being used as a a love perfume or something like that many years ago. I seem to remember we all dressed up as gladiators and, and Romans or yeah, something yeah, like I, that. Yeah, more, I can't remember. We just can't that, remember. <laughs> Egyptians and you know sucking the brains out of noses and all that kind of stuff. To, oh, yeah, there's a lot on there. But I think that was that was before before people were kind of like really into streaming it on YouTube and downloading yeah. it or uploading it as it were. Um, that's kind of that's how old I am. It was, it was kind of pre YouTube. Pre YouTube, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's amazing though know, how many old shows now make their way onto YouTube that people have uh, recorded and kept. Um, I mean, yeah, there's certainly uh, tons of yeah, yeah. tons of the networks doing. Yeah. They'll, they'll kind of dig out the archives and, mm. and they'll stick it out there. Yeah, it is nice when they do that. Yeah, it's great. A, a similar show to the Yuck Show, because um, it was also you know about fun facts and stuff like that. Was Prove It? Um, I love that show. I thought that was great. Well, that's got a long story. Prove It. That was um, that was fantastic. I, I auditioned um, for that, and originally it was going to be um, usual duo, a boy and, and a girl, and then the the exec saw saw it and were like, I wonder if it'll work with two guys. And uh, there's a guy called. Um, Joe Challenge, who I presented with, and he was actually a CBBC presenter, <clears throat> and my ex was one of his producers, and he and I met him a couple of times, and he was a good laugh, good looking lad, Joe, and he came down for this audition, and we clicked like a house, like I'd, I'd, I'd never not known him, and we sat in this room to practice his, because I already had the job, so I was we were looking for a, a, a number two presenter, and he came in, and we sat, and we and we just started ad libbing. And we went through every style of TV you can imagine, news, kids, factual, adult, <clears throat> lifestyle, cooking. Anyway, the producers knocked on the door and I went, are you two ready yet? We, oh, no, hang on a minute. But we, had, we had to practice this sketch. And it was the, the ostrich one we did, which we actually shot for the, for the main show. And um, he left the audition and I said, it's got to be Joe. It's just got to be him. And, and we did two series uh, literally all over the country on two separate years. And it was, we had them that's probably the most fun I've had on location. We had such a good time and did so many cool things. Yeah, I, I remember it well because um, it, it was a show about science and proving facts. Um, yeah. I was trying to remember some of the ones that I remember. I remember one, and it was about hu- human hair can lift a like a human person like on a crane. Right. Uh, yeah. I remember one about pendulums and used well, a the gun. The pendulum one had my mum in it. Yes, I remember. Yeah, I yeah, remember. I, I, 
I didn't know that. So we, we did this to sit outside on the, on the, in the uh, in the car park at the, at the, at, um, the Maystone Studios. So basically, the pendulum is like like so if you get a swing and you pull the swing back up to your chest and let go, it will only go back the other way as, as high as where you started it from. It won't go any higher. No matter how, how high you hold it and let go, it won't go any higher than the original start point. And every time it then comes back, it gets lower and lower. So they tested this thing with a lever. So as it came up the other side, if it touched the lever, it would open up the gun tank and, you know, our researcher was going to get covered in guns. So we kind of had to set it so it didn't quite touch. And it was all fat, all fine. And we, we did the rehearsal and they put me back behind the, the big train. And I went, right, action. And as I came around the corner, I could see out the corner of my eye that the person in the tank wasn't the researcher. But I can't look yet because I'm still supposed to be talking to Joe and doing my line. And then as I get level with it, I'm like, oh my God, it's my mum. And I know what's going to happen. She's going to get, if this guy's wrong, she's going to get covered. And I'm like, hello, mummy. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was, it was, and we did the same with Joe on a lie detector. We got his mum in for that. So, um, yeah, we did things like, um, do sharks, do sharks always attack humans? Um, no, prove it. So they threw me in a, in a shark tank and made me swim with sharks. Um, and there's bungee jumping and, oh, there's all kinds of stuff going on. It's great. It was. It was just a shame that it didn't seem to run for, for very long. But that was about the time when CITV kind of pulled all its, uh, in-house production, sadly. Yeah, they, yeah, it was a very political decision um, because it was, it was a show called How, then How Two, mm. then Prove It. It was it was a new it was a new kind of factual entertainment science show. And it rated well, um, but then I shan't mention names, but certain people came in and decided that they didn't they didn't want that kind of thing anymore, um, and then moved across to the BBC and ruined kids BBC, and then came back. And re ruined CITV whilst the BBC then rebuilt everything that this particular person had destroyed. Um, and when this person came across to ITV, we all panicked, and, and rightly so, because suddenly my department was shut down, and 35 people lost their jobs overnight. Mm. So we kind of we kind of knew it was coming. But then I, I rewrote it, I, re, I rewrote the show, and it was called um, I Say. Yeah. And one of the guys that was going to help me with it, um, a guy called Ted Bather. We'd worked together on stuff, and he had a cartoon called Bike and Mice from Mars that he'd created. And so I knew him from the kids' sector. And we flew out, because it was the show Prove It was massive in France. It was the biggest or highest rated uh, children's show on their kids' network called Gouli. Okay. So I spoke to the, to the French producers and said, look, here's the idea. Can we come and see you? And they said, yeah, please do. So Ted and I flew to Paris. I said, look, this is what we're going to do. Here's, here's the content. Here's the, the context of what we'll do. We'll shoot it in France if needs be. We'll use your team, blah, blah, blah. We'd like you to kind of co-invest. Um, and they eventually came back and said, we've only ever co-invested in animation, cartoons. We've never done it with live action. Um, we don't want to do that on this one. But what we'll do is we will give you a 100% guarantee that if you make it, we'll buy it. But I couldn't get um, CITV or anybody over here to, to fund it. So um, it never happened. It was, and it would have cost probably about, at the time, seventy grand a show, sixty grand a show. <clears throat> you know, and it was far too expensive for me to to, to afford one show, <laughs> let alone mm. twenty six. <laughs> it's a great shame, great shame, but yeah. a good show, good show. Uh, yeah, good show. I remember it well, and they did. They again, they they did re-air it quite a lot for quite a while. Um, yeah, I got into a bit of trouble because when I they they when they repeated. Um, uh, what was it? Um, all or nothing. Yeah, we, we, we were still doing um, up on the roof, or then Synatic at, at, at one point, and I was on both the BBC, BBC One, and CITV at the same time. <laughs> and my boss wasn't very happy. I said, "Well, it's not my fault. I didn't schedule it, and I shot these, you know, at different times. It's not not my fault. They're on at the same time." But yeah, I was on the BBC and ITV at the same time for, for about six months. <laughs> Just couldn't get away from you on the telly. Well, oh, yeah. And that, now I'm no every seen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like, you know, during the time that you uh, were doing Prove It and the Yuck Show and all that, you were still on weekend mornings. And like you say, Up on the Roof then became Toonatic, um, which again ran yeah. for five years. Um, and it, it was basically the follow on from Up on the Roof, wasn't it? It was just the next generation of, of that show, like a yeah, continuation. Yeah, what happened was we started to eat into the. Um, the Disney ratings quite heavily and we looked at how much we were paying Disney for their studio show and for animation compared to what we were giving to, to us um, for a longer time a longer time slot and the ratings we were getting 
so the director of programs came up to me and he said, um, could we do an entire weekend? And I said, well, we could, but we couldn't sustain it. We'd, we'd have to have a, you know, it, up on the roof is, is too small a show to sustain for that amount of time. We would need a, a, a studio based show or a link based show. So he said, OK, write me a plan. So myself and two of my colleagues, my head of department and another girl, we kind of put this plan together and created Toon Attic. Um, and yeah, that kind of literally, after we got that set up, we came off air from Toon Up on the Roof, and I think it was about the following week or a couple of weeks later, boom, we were, we were back on with, with Toon Attic. And that was a much, much bigger show. It was. It was yeah. uh, a big studio show, and you had a co-host as well, and you, Anna Williamson, and, and a group right. of kids each weekend, Boys versus Girl Battle. Um, yeah. Must have been good fun. Yeah, it was great fun. Um, uh, had its moments, like you know, all jobs do. But you have to remember, the bit that you see on TV is, is the final glossy, you know, shiny floor version mm. of a week's worth of fast turnaround production and ideas you know, several hours of a studio retaking certain bits, doing an edit and all the polish, and, and off it goes again. So we did have a lot of fun doing it. Um, but yeah, it was, again, very technical. And sometimes, especially if you're not feeling well, and we shot that very early in the morning, you'd walk in and go, the last thing I want to be doing is <laughs> jumping around the studio with bright lights and screaming kids and getting covered in crap. <laughs> but you have to go, woo! Yeah. You know, Mine's an and we're off. Yeah, it goes back to my question earlier about, you know, the early mornings. I mean, was Toonatic live or was no. that pre- No. No, that was, okay. that was pre-recorded. Was okay. All, but we, we shot it as live. So what would happen is that we'd, we'd run the tape, record it, and if we got it done in one, move on. Yeah. That, that was it. Very, very seldomly, because we didn't have much studio time. So mm. very, very occasionally we, we'd reshoot a couple of links or i then go, mm, oh, we can do it better than that, or the timing wasn't quite right, we can make it funnier or slicker, and we'd have the luxury to, of, of redoing it. Um, and we could, we, could, we could get away with, or well, we could do more because it was pre-recorded, so we could, we could stage certain things, whereas if it was live, some of the sketches that we did, we would never have been able to do, mm. uh, because you couldn't cut quick enough or change costume quick enough. Yeah. So the, 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 the luxury of doing a, a pre-record was the fact that we could have more fun and and do you know more more camera trickery as you were? Yeah, certainly. And uh, it was it was a good show. And uh, like like I say, there was this boys versus girls battle between the kids on the show. Yeah. Uh, lots of crazy challenges that you. I mean, you invented up loads over those five years. Yeah, hundreds of them. There was one that was uh, what was it called? The one where a smash and grab. That was it. Smash, smash and grab. So you had all these. I'd ask the boys a question, or I'd ask the girls a question. Dan and I would kind of like, we'd, we'd ask opposing teams. And if they got the question right, they kind of smash their hand to one of these numbers and pull out a prop. And it would be, you know, swap points, add points, deduct points, or whatever it happened to be. And 99 out of 100 times, I was I would lose that one. I'd be way ahead on the points throughout the morning. We'd play this poxy game and I'd, <laughs> I'd lose everything. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember Anton, Anton Deck's Wonky Donkey. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Where it had to rhyme and then Deck would deliberately get, you know, cross. Um, because people would say things that wouldn't rhyme, he'd scream at them down the yeah, end. Yeah, I remember. Brilliant. So I kind of nicked that idea on, on this particular show, to, on this particular game. So whenever it went wrong, and I decided to really start to lose, I'd really go nuts at, at, at my team, which of course they loved. They thought it was hilarious. And <laughs> so when we cut cameras, they'd be crying with laughter. <laughs> and I got, I got, I got one complaint about it once. <laughs> <laughs> some, some dad had written in saying that he didn't like the fact that I was shouting at the, at the boys. Uh, which I think I, I spoke to you on air and said, turn over then. I don't, <laughs> don't like it, don't watch. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you've got Sky where you've got five million channels. Go and watch one of them. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never get you presenting points of view, that's for certain. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> oh, <I'm> opinionated. <laughs> oh, fantastic stuff. And... Um... Um, I mean, yeah, like I say, you, you looked like you had an absolute blast doing that. And I thought there was there was a great on-screen partnership with you and Anna, Anna Williamson. It seemed like you really got on with each other. And, and uh, yeah, and she was they're like brother and sister, really. Mm. Um, she's great. She's a very good presenter, and we had yeah, we had we had a really good chemistry. Um, she would there'd be a look because I I used to come off script all the time. We'd 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 know the script inside out which is why we'd have so much fun with it. But and something would happen or... Because obviously it's a very fluid situation. So you've got, you've got your script and what you've got to say. There's no auto cue. So we, we, we learned everything we were doing. 
And if something would happen or I'd see an opportunity, I, they would, I'd look at her and she'd know instinctively that I was about to do something. And so she, she'd give me that. She'd feed me the line or she'd, she'd give me the space to do it. And then she'd run with it with me. And vice versa, if I saw her off on one or she'd kind of react to something, I'd let her, I'd let her, we'd go off script and I'd, I'd let her do the same. Um, so we could really enjoy what was going And then you'd bring it back onto script and, and finish the link. Uh, yeah, but we, we had um, we had a lot of lot of lot of fun on that. I want to kind of go on to key moments in the show, and there's there's two in particular I want to bring up first yeah. before asking you about about yours. One of which I didn't actually know happened until looking online for research, and I've got to ask, did this actually happen? Because it was just saying... I know where you're going to go. Go on, go on. Okay, so I read online that some time ago, you and Anna were filming a sketch for Toonatic out in London, dressed in combat gear, flak jackets, and waving around glittery hairdryers as if they were guns, and apparently you got stopped by anti-terror police. Is this true? Sure, so. The show was called um, Dork Hunters, Casted. It wasn't a brilliant casting, and we were trying to do uh, a sketch in, in between the, the part one and part two to try and boost the ratings. So we, we would run around trying to find these, these weird aliens, and then we'd, it was like Ghostbusters, really. Yeah. We'd pull out our hairdryer and we'd, we'd aim at them, um, and then we'd put all the effects on in the edit, and, and one of us would get the points. And we were shooting up by the, uh, the Millennium Wheel, uh, just out from the studios. And we had a full crew, you know, and we we're all dressed in silly gear, and we had a, there were um, stab, stab proof jacket that's what we had on like a, like a body vest yeah um, but covered in velcro and I had trains and planes and tweets and all kinds of stuff hanging off mine and on my belt was a blue, I had a blue hair dryer and Anna had a pink hair dryer and this it was normal police this particular uh, policeman came up to us and said you know who are you what are you doing and we showed him the permits all that kind of stuff um, and he just oh no it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a female police officer that was it a female police officer came up to us and said, what are you doing? And we showed all the stuff. And she said, oh, that's fine. I, you know, I hope it goes well. We were chatting away. And as she was doing that, this, this other police man came up and started to kind of, you know, flex his muscles and go, well, I want more detail. I'm like, well, like, we'll, we'll come with this. We'll take you to the studio, if you like. It's 300 yards away. And he wasn't having any of it. So he said, I'm holding you here under section, I think it was section 22 of the old Anti-Terrorism Act. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> And I said, to, I said to my producer, I said, keep the cameras rolling, just film all of this. So he kept the cameras going. But obviously, it all finished. And he had a pad, and he wrote this, all this stuff down, and he said, um, right, read that and sign it, please. So I read it, and I said, no, I'm not signing it. So he said, why not? So I said, because the reason you stopped us, well, the reason you're saying you stopped us is because you thought we, we were, had some kind of weird gun. And I said, it wasn't. It was a blue spangly hairdryer. I said, if you write down, you stop me because you saw a blue spangly hairdryer, I'll sign it. If not, I won't sign it because you haven't mentioned it. And he said, oh, I'm not writing that. I said, I'm not signing it then. <laughs> we'll have to do it at the police station, which is only up the road. So he went, all right, give me the pad. So he then wrote into, onto the pad and stopped Mr. Rickers due to the fact he was carrying a blue spangly hairdryer. <laughs> and, I said, and I signed it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. But then that night or the following, I think it was the following night, we, uh, we then sent the, the, those rushes off to ITN and, it, yeah, hit the 10 o'clock news. Really? Do you, do you know what? Until yeah. last night, I didn't know that happened. It was literally just through doing Google searching about Toonatic for research that the, the old article came up. And I was like, no, that didn't really happen. I've got to ask him that. That's a fantastic story. Yeah, but well, it wasn't anti-terror police. It was just it was, it was, um, it was a female police officer that obviously said, what are you up to? And she was fine. And it was just this younger... Um, was a of, a of a police man that you know stood on her toes. We were like, we've already done this with the with the female mm. officer. Leave us alone, and he, and he wasn't having, having any of it. And the funny thing was, while we, we were standing in, and he was checking us all out, this mother walked past her two kids. <laughs> it went, oh, Jamie, yeah, can we have your graph? <laughs> so we had a joint photograph with us and both the police officers. It was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read the story on the, on the, a certain newspaper website. So you know they always like to bend the truth a bit and add you know add a bit of uh, you know a bit of saucy gossip to it. So it did say anti-terror yeah. police, but you know even just the fact you were stopped by police for carrying around a, a, a glittery hairdryer is just funny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was great fun. God, you said you had two defining moments. Go on. What's your other one? Uh, the other one is having Charlie Brooker on the show. Um, <laughs> that was quite oh, bizarre. Right. Uh, what what did you think of that? Well, that was great because. One of the producers came to us and said, look, um, I thought the name of the show was called now. 
Um, it, was, it, was, Brooker, um, it was Charlie Brooker's screen wipe. Screen wipe, that was it. They said they, they want to come and do this thing on Kiss Presenting and they want to have a look at you guys because it's a popular show. Of course, everybody went, oh, yeah, great, get him on. And I was a bit dubious at first. And I they said, what, what's wrong? I said, well, it, yeah, it's great. I said, but he has a very, usually what he does, he looks at stuff. And if he doesn't like it, he slates it. And if he slates us, bearing in mind that we're up against the beam, it could be damaging. We've got to be, we've got to be sensitive on how he approached it. So all that was thrashed out. Any, anyway, he, he came on. He was lovely. He was a really nice guy. I mean, we did, we did a couple of opening links with him where we said, there's your script. And I gave him, I think it was about 35, 40 seconds to learn the, to learn the link. I took it away. He said, I haven't learned it yet. And I said, well, yeah, that's it. That's all your time you got. <laughs> we got. We got 12 of these to do and an hour and a half to, to shoot it in. So you, you haven't got a second chance. And off he went. And he came off the end of it. And he went, crush it. He said, I don't know how, how you, not just Anna and me, but other you know, kids are doing the same kind of stuff for, and as live or, or, or live links. How you learn it so quick and how you how you control it so fast and move things like it's it's, it's really really fast. Um, and I said, yeah, it is. It's conditioning. It's like anything. Once once you get into a job and you get used to it, it becomes the norm. Yeah. So you know, if I went to go and do say your job and I'm operating a radio desk, when I, I remember when I first went into heart and was looking at stuff and it was like, I'm never going to learn this. You know, and after three weeks practice, you kind of mix it and fade it and flip it to the news. You know, it's like you do it. Yeah, and it's, it becomes a norm. Anybody else looking at you goes, "How the hell do you do that?" And it's practice. That's all it is. It's like learning an instrument. Yeah, certainly. It becomes second yeah, nature. Yeah, he, 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 he was he was great. <laughs> I know it's just it's just bizarre that he he was on it in the first place. Uh, did did that actually go out on CITV? That one, or was it just part of? No, that that went out on his show. Oh, okay. I, 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 I wondered. Channel Four, I think, or Channel Five. I can't remember now. Uh, BBC Four. I used to watch it. BBC Four. I used to watch it. Um, it was yeah. it was quite a funny show, uh, and uh, yeah, it was just just a bizarre thing to see. But yeah, it looked like uh, you, yeah. had, you had good fun doing that. <laughs> uh, like I say, I was going to ask about your key moments, your favourite bits. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as, a, as far as a defining moment goes, I mean, there weren't any really defining moments because we, we had so many different kids on there, was, mm. and some of the kids were just brilliant. I mean, there was one bit where this, the kid had to stick his face, or both kids had to put their face in this tub of custard and pull things out, and the kid was so small. It's on on YouTube actually. I lifted him up, and it looks like I'm drowning him. And he's literally covered from head down to his waist in custard. Um, and he was such a good sport. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do that now on kids' TV. But there were there were incidents like that, and the kids were brilliant. But the one the one that that made a particular tabloid paper, shall we say, was um, Jamie Jamie Richards goes naked on 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 kids' TV, and we had a comp- <laughs> We had a lot of complaints from this woman. He's all online in South End, disgusted to see that they allow a children's presenter to go naked, and the children were clearly embarrassed and didn't know where to look. And it was rubbish. We removed the children from the from the studio, and I was wearing boxer shorts, mm. just like you, you know, normal boxer shorts, and a, a, a skin uh, skin tight uh, skin covered tights on. Yeah, over over the top. Um, and then in front of me, I had a big cardboard board with competition details on it so you couldn't actually and then obviously my top was 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 off and you could see the wire but you couldn't see anything from really from below my neck down until down to below my knee that was all I was totally covered that's the fact i was wearing clothes and then once we we shot that a bit and me walking out pretending to be naked we brought the kids back in i was clothed and then i walked down again and we shot just the kids you'll never see me and the kids in the shot at the same time yeah and we got there and pointing, and then we cut it together so it looks like I'm walking in between them. But yeah, but we did two different parties. But that hit the news and all the rest of it. You know, as soon as you get a complaint about being naked with children, you know, you've got to be a bit sensitive towards it. <laughs> but our, our producers and legal team were brilliant. They were like, it's crap, so go away. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That was funny. Certainly, certainly. It, it, was, it was a chaotic show, absolutely mental, but good fun. Yeah. Very funny. And we had, we had, you know, we had a, a big, strong team. There were probably about 20 other people in the production office. And that's before you get into, into, ga- into studio where you've got lights, cameras, all your gallery crew, so, you know, your directors, uh, PAs, uh, <clears throat> in, sound engineers, line engineers, all, you know, floor managers, all that kind of stuff, cameras. So by the time you've gone from production <clears throat> into, into the studio, and then obviously when you come out of the studio, you've got your editors and all that kind of stuff. Um, a great team. Yeah, you know, people come, people go, people move on. Um, yeah, we were very lucky to be blessed with a very 
very talented team over those five years. Great stuff. And um, one of the things that happened at the end of every show, um, either yourself or Anna would would end up with large custard pies shoved in your face at the end. Um, And uh, from what I've heard from other presenters that I've spoken to, receiving a custard pie can sometimes be uncomfortable or painful. Was was it ever for you? Was it ever a, a not pleasant experience? Or it's only painful if you get hit hard, like getting punched in the face. But Anna and I never, you know, we, we knew what we were doing. But sometimes the kids would do it, and they they'd really zap it to you, and that you think, you know, could almost bust me. One kid in particular did it. He's just overexcited and and pushed this thing in. And you know, I think he was thought he was fighting Mike Tyson or something, and then he knocked me clean over. <laughs> There's a big lad. It's like ah. Oh! To be sure, but as far as the actual custom pies are concerned, it, we we were just using um, shaving foam and that kind of stuff. Mm. So as long as you get your eyes closed, it, it, it was fine. Yeah. We, we did it with cream in a very early show, long before up on the roof, and uh, it was cream, and that kind of goes up your nose and in your ears, and it's up your nose for weeks till it just it, it sets. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing with, you know, if you, if you want to be a kids' TV presenter, every now and again you've got to expect to get covered in guns and pies. That just comes with the nature. Yeah, it's part, part of it. It's a prerequisite. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's basically like the um, the rites of passage of being a children's TV presenter. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to come into your career at some point. Yeah, children passing out, covered in guns, and animals are crap everywhere. Apart from that, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, I mean, like I say, popular show, ran for, for five years, and then all of a sudden it just ended suddenly in 2010, which, to be honest, I didn't think it was... It doesn't seem that long ago, but it's been it's been 10 years yeah, now. Yeah, um, we've, got, we've got a bit of grief for that, because, um, you know, people... A lot of, a lot of tears, a, a lot of angry parents that were crossed that it had suddenly stopped, and, oh, Jamie and Anna must have been given a better offer and where we go, and it was all rubbish. We, we were told in March that... Um, we were going to be made redundant in May. So we had like eight, uh, March, April, May. Yeah, it was eight weeks. <clears throat> or nine weeks when we were told. And um, we, whilst that was running, we shot another pilot for another star show, which reduced the cost because it was a money thing. Um, the show that we, I won't go into politics, but the show that we produced and had was even cheaper, but better looking than what they eventually replaced it with. I know that sounds like sour grapes, but it's all on tape and, and, the, and the facts are all there if anybody ever wanted to see them. But it was political. They they bought into GMTV and they got rid of the GMTV kids department and they just moved the CITV department in. It was, it was just a political move and they were like, you've got eight weeks and you're out of a job. And that was it. And it was quite a bit of backlash. You know, well, why have you left? Well, our kids are upset. You're like, you're upset. I've got, <laughs> I've got no money now. <laughs> and it, it, was, it, it was literally just the rug was just pulled under our feet. Thanks very much for the last 10 years. See you, bye. And that was it, gone. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. when you did that last show, uh, were you really sad? I imagine you were. Yeah, I thought I'd be okay. And then we had a bit of fun and lots of you know reminiscing. And then there's one link where they opened the door and we had a lot of kids that were quite regular on the show. And these, all these kids came flying through and that's what got me. I saw the kids for the last time. I was like, oh, I'm not going to work with them again. They're so cool. And that, that, that really upset me, yeah. It was a very sad day. There were, there were crew and camera guys in in tears it was kind of like we cannot believe this is happening because mm. uh, it was it was such a family and such a team um and it wasn't even like oh we're coming in the run and we're gonna we're gonna go you know up on the roof to natick to something else it was like no um we're gonna use a different department and we're gonna give them less money and you're out of a job thanks bye it, yeah. it, was, it was it was a kind of finality in the and the harshness of, of, of how it was done you know it was real, real corporate stuff yeah, I think what I think what's the nice thing about that though, if you think about it, is that uh, Two Natic and Up on the Roof are still well remembered by the people who watched it. Whatever he placed it, I couldn't tell you what that was because I don't know. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's a show that's looked back fondly on. Yeah, I mean we had great fun, great fun doing it, and actually, you know, being treated like that as, as horrible as it is at the time, it does teach you, you know, a really good lesson in, in business moving forward. And there's been other times in my career where things have started, I've seen things start to go a certain way. And rather than try and go, well, I should be loyal to the show and all this but you have to go, no, no, I'm going to look after me now. And then you, 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 have, you, you have to become hardened and selfish and go, I'm not interested. Yeah. When this stops, I've still got two children I've got to pay for. I've still got a mortgage I've got to pay for. You know, I've got a life. I've, I've got this, all of this stuff needs, needs funding. Mm. You know, it's all very well being nice and friendly and, oh, isn't it sad? But at the end of the day, 
you need to eat. You need, you need to make money. So it, it was it was um, a harsh lesson to be taught, but one I'm glad I did. Certainly. And off the back of Toon Attic, um, you and Anna went on to present for Nickelodeon for a while. Yeah, well, we got called into the, the meeting room. We were actually sitting in makeup at the time. And one of the producers came downstairs and said, um, uh, we've got an emergency meeting in the boardroom. So we got we kind of whisked up in the boardroom and given the bad news, you know, in eight weeks' time, May or whatever it is, that we your last show. And um, we came out. Anna went back into makeup. And I rang my agent and I said, call Nickelodeon, call Disney and call the Cartoon Network. Anyway, a week later, I had a meeting with uh, Nickelodeon, um, and they said, "Look, can we do this? Can we do that? Can you? Have you got a production company? Can can you produce it?" And I went, "Yeah, that's fine. I'll work out costing." <clears throat> I looked at all of that, went back for a second meeting, and I said, "Why don't Why don't we get Anna to come as well? What? It's not just not just me. Why don't we bring Anna?" And he said, "Will she do it?" And I said, "Well, think about it. You've got two kids presenters that have been, and the whole team booted off the ITV network." The, and the show was the highest rated kids um, show at the time on on the weekend and Nickelodeon have, have, have snapped us up and got it it's a, it's a great marketing tool for you he said absolutely will, will Anna do it and I said yes yeah. and he said well how do you know and I said because I rang her three days ago and asked her <laughs> <laughs> so she came in with her agent on what was my third meeting and her first one and we signed the contract there and then and off we went and we did two years at Nickelodeon yeah. Uh, was it like straight, like pretty much two Natic one week and that finished and then next week or a few weeks later on to Nickelodeon? Was it, was it quite seamless? It was, uh, it was a couple of months. It was a couple, couple of months. A couple of months. So we we had, um, we came off air in, in May, I think it was, 2010, um, and back on air a couple of months later. So yeah, we've, we've come out of that contract, gone into Nickelodeon to, to do the setup and the, and the prep before we shot it, and then away we went. Yeah, it was a couple of months. So, yeah, it was, it was quite quick. Yeah, and you had good fun presenting on Nickelodeon as well. Yeah, great, great fun. Again, um, a lot of the team, though, was the team. I brought them with us. Um, so the, 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 and then, yeah, obviously, there were new, new people in there, but it was it was a kind of like a, 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 a scaled-down version of, of Toonatic. Yeah. Uh, some of the key guys came across. Um, and, and, off, and off we went. So it was, it was it was almost like we'd just been on holiday and came back to start again, mm. but on a, on a kind of smaller budget. But, but saying that, some of the stuff we did with that budget was how we started doing Up on the Roof, but we've made it look like Tunatic. The producers mm. were, were brilliant, and what we could do with that money and how we did it, um, again, just shows the talent of, of some of these guys and these girls that, that, that were working at, at the time. And again, that grew. We did the, we did the weekend show, but for um, Nickelodeon, and then we did um, Camp Orange. So we, we had, we had, you know, everything just kind of gradually grew. And we had a two-year contract and fulfilled that, and off we went. In a way, it kind of come full circle. And it's uh, it's always nice when, like like you say, like you had a smaller budget, but there was a lot of creativity there, and you made it work. And I think that, that sh- you know, sometimes that's better. It doesn't all have to be all fancy bells and whistles. It's sometimes just nice when... You know, yeah, but, I, but again, when you that's one of those things when you're when you you're not working in the industry, mm. you go, well, there's all that money we can we can spend it on this, but you can't. There's, there's not actually that amount of money that yet that you have to produce stuff. There, there, you know, everything's very very tight and getting tighter. Yeah. So even if you've got double your budget, you're still looking at how you create the same effect by saving. So you're kind of indoctrined and, and conditioned into getting the most you can for your buck, no matter whatever the budget is. I got asked on one occasion at a GMTV um, by the head of finance, can I can I rewrite this two nastic budget for thirty percent, forty percent, and fifty percent less? And we went, well, we can do thirty percent and forty percent, but we're not doing fifty percent. And we thought we have to, and we refuse to do it. So we cannot make this show. We cannot make two nastic on half the budget. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. So we never did it. We, we never we, we did a thirty and forty percent. And even then, it was it was close to the mark. But um, even even back then, when money was was kind of like more readily available, they're still looking at cutting. Yeah, it's a that's, shame. And that's that's why you don't get as many studio live based studio shows like you did, you know, back in the eighties when CBBC was kind of ruling the roost on that because they're really expensive. And because you've got so many um, channels now, kids are they're um, cartoon loyal, should we say, or, or production loyal rather than channel loyal. So if you're a SpongeBob fan, for example, 
you'll watch it on CBBC. Then if it suddenly flicks over to the Carter Network, you'll watch it on that. You'll, and you'll, wherever SpongeBob goes, you'll find it. Whereas before, when we had a couple of shows, you had BBC One or ITV, ITV One, and you'd, you'd watch the show. Now now it, it's kind of cartoon loyalty as opposed to channel loyalty. Yeah, it's a great shame. Um, and I feel like I was part of that last generation where it was children's television was on after school or a weekend on the terrestrial channels and that was it. Yeah. But then, you know, in the 2000s, all these digital channels came about. And the more children's channels there are, the more the audience is divided up into smaller pieces. And, and you know, it's had a yeah. knock-on effect. You know, the, the budgets have gotten smaller. and Well, exactly. That's yeah. the thing. The budget suddenly becomes a lot less. When I was a kid, when I was a kid... Um, and watching um, kids TV, you know, you had two, and then three. So BBC One and ITV, and then they do a bit on BBC Two. So you had three channels. I think the last count there were something like twenty six or twenty seven designated children's channels now. Yeah, yeah. There's you loads. know, so you got from three to twenty six. That's probably more now. But um, it, you know, so the budgets are rapidly reduced. Yeah, and also we've got stuff like Netflix now and all that. So exactly, but it's, it's silly things as well, like. More children um, between, the, well, I don't know what the demographic is now, it was kind of similar to what we wanted for kids' shows. So uh, depending on the time of, of, of air, so let's just say 7 to, to 13-year-olds, for example, um, more children in between the age of 7 and 13 will watch EastEnders um, than they did children's programmes, which actually meant that EastEnders was the biggest children's show on, you know, in, in the country. What? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You might get half a million kids watching a CBBC show, but you'll get a million kids watching EastEnders. Oh, you the same. could not sit and watch that as a ch- child, and I could certainly not watch it now. So <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the point I'm, you get yes. the point I'm making. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. No, it is it is a shame. Things have changed a lot since since then. It, yeah. is, it is crazy. Um, so it's it's been great chatting about all all those you know great shows. I mean, what I want to what I want to know now is you know what are you up to these days. You know what what do you do? Uh, well, I had to make a very conscious decision because I went from that onto. Uh, late night ITV and was doing some of the gambling stuff for them. Yeah. And then reality TV kicked in. So the jobs that, you know, I would normally have auditioned for or be put forward for would now now naturally go to um, reality TV people. I, I refrain from using the word stars. Um, and like I said, I've still got to feed people. So I, I came out of doing the, um, the late night stuff because it was just, there wasn't enough money involved with it. And I'd actually met some, some, some people whilst I was in a particular office doing Nickelodeon stuff so I ended up working for, for two of my friends um, and I moved we moved money around the globe so whether it's you're going on holiday or whether it's a, a company buying media stuff or whatever it has to be we shift the move, move the money around hmm. um, and there's stuff that we're doing and looking at at the moment with a, with a media angle in that which we're trying to develop which I shall kind of help help run on that side of things so I don't, I don't really do much media at the moment. It's more in the financial sector, um, with a with a look at hopefully getting this media division up and running. So come come back to me in three months, and I'll let you know where it works. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, I mean, if if they said, you know, Jamie, we want you back on children's television to do weekend mornings <laughs> again, would you do it? It's a difficult one to answer that. Because <laughs> Who knows? Those shows, those shows don't exist anymore. No, they don't, but they should do. You know, hypothetically, if they said, like, yeah, we're going to bring them all back, you know. Well, you... providing they offer me a very long contract <laughs> with uh, with an increase in salary that reflects the 10 years I've not been there, <laughs> then I consider it, yeah. Uh, but they, they, they wouldn't be offering that kind of money anymore. They're, they're probably not. No, no. Especially in these uncertain times as well. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, if anybody wants to kind of follow what you're up to, or you know, share their memories of watching you on TV, where can they find you online? What's your social media? Oh, I'm on. I've got an Instagram page, um, uh, Facebook, TV Jamie Richards. Uh, I've got a Twitter, all the usual: mm. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm, I'm on all those. You can find me on find me on those. I don't I don't use it that much, but um, yeah, if you, I, I always check it. Yeah. I very, very rarely post stuff. So if people want to, um, like you did, mm-hmm. drop me a message and, I, and I'll, I'll read it. And I'll, I'll, if anybody sends a personal message, I, I, I reply to all of them. That's great. That's 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 you know really sound of you. I think you know because not everybody well, that's, does. That's, that's an old Andy Peters thing. That was Andy mm. taught me that very early on. 
anybody that, that Laura acting has, has anything personal to them, he would always work his way through it. Um, and I never forgot that. So I do exactly the same. I don't get as much as I used to, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, any, any messages that I do get, um, I, I always reply. Yeah, and if anybody wants to message you and, and say, you know, share their memories of watching you, um, you'll be happy to uh, oh, receive absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, or ask them an advice. I'm more than happy to. I mean, I lecture quite a bit at universities and uh, people are trying to get into the industry. And I'll, you know, look, I had a lot, a lot of people help. Well, a lot of people offered to help me. Only a few did. Um, so I always remember that. So if I say I'll, I'll help, I'll always help. Yeah, people help me, and, and that's, I think that's important. Definitely, definitely. And, and when you, you lecture at universities, um, obviously, you know, the, 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 the students there would have been kids at the time of when you were on telly. Do a lot of them come up to you and say, I remember watching you on, on television and stuff like that? Yeah, so, sometimes they come up and say, I remember watching you, it was great. Other, other ones just want to, you know, smash me in the face. <laughs> 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 no, they're, they're all good, really. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's usually kind of like, what was it like? How did you get into it? It's, 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 yeah. There's a story I get all the time happening. How did you start? Um, that's that's the main one, and then how to survive in it. Mm, yeah, and there, there are little tricks on how to survive, but you have to find your own way, really. Definitely, definitely. Well, Jamie, it's been great chatting about your time on children's television and, and hearing your memories. It's been really good. Thank you so much for taking part today. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking. I lo- love every second of it. Any time. Fantastic, so for you. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Jack. Take care, buddy. Bye bye. Thank you for listening and a big thanks as well to Jamie for taking part. Do follow him on Twitter and send him your Toonatic memories. Well, that's it for another podcast, but there will be another one next month. And of course, you can listen to any of the previous editions too. There's plenty to choose from. Until next time, I'll see you soon.